Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 311 Griffin YouTube channel. This is another Red Dead Redemption Guns in Real Life. But I like to do these if I can get my hands on the real firearm. And today we're doing the Schofield, or the Smith & Wesson number 3, or in this case the modern variant that I have is a Uberti Top Break uh, imported by Taylors & Company. So this is actually one of my favorite pistols of all time. It is absolutely my favorite revolver of all time, and it is by far my favorite uh, Old West uh, short gun. It's not necessarily the greatest pistol out there, but when it comes to being aesthetically pleasing and a clever design, I think that this is as good as it can get. So very quickly, let's go through some history. There's a lot of history that gets a little bit confused and we're not gonna go through all of it, but it is a, it is interesting. And I touched on some of this when I did the single action army slash cattleman revolver. Uh, but the Schofield was first uh, adopted in 1870. It was produced between 1870 and about 1915, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the United States Army adopted the Model 3 revolver in 1870. That's what they called it at the time. It was chambered in 44 Smith & Wesson American. And it's actually the first standard issue cartridge firing revolver in U.S. service. Uh, so before that time, there were some other cartridge revolvers around then. But up until that time, they were shooting the cap and ball revolvers. There were lots of cap and ball revolvers through the Civil War period and then into the late 60s. And the U.S. Army was still using those. So um, so Smith & Wesson was given the contract on these. Um, so in 1875, the United States government uh, granted Smith & Wesson a contract to, uh, to outfit the military with number three or model three revolvers. Uh, with that were actually the the Schofield design. They had the improvements that George Wheeler Schofield yeah. had uh, provided. Um, but the United States government wanted them to be chambered in 45 Colt or 45 Long Colt because that was already in use by the United States military. And Smith and Wesson kind of made a blunder. Well, actually, they made a big blunder. They decided to make their own proprietary round and it was a little bit shorter it was the 45 Schofield and this is something that uh, manufacturers today continue to do everybody wants their own proprietary thing because I think they believe that it it means they can um, kind of corner certain markets or I, I don't know it, it's something that a lot of people do it didn't really work very well because the United States government had loads of 45 Long Colt in service uh, or already purchased and the single action army that Colt made could actually fire both cartridges, the 45 Schofield and the 45 Long Colt. So they just decided that they were going with the the uh, single action army from Colt and they weren't going to use the Schofield. There were some other interesting things about Schofield. Um, he got a payment for each gun sold at the time uh, and his brother was the head of the army ordnance board so there was a little bit of conflict of interest there um, and that's probably why the 45 schofield was adopted but you could argue also that it is a much easier gun to reload especially from horseback or when you're in a hurry um, than the single action army the single action army is a gigantic pain to reload uh, if you practice with it you can get fairly good but um, it's it's just a pain um, a lot of the Schofields, they were originally in 7-inch, and uh, a lot of them were then sold, and, and various people used them, various famous people used them. Jesse James had a Schofield. Um, a Wyatt Earp apparently used one at the gunfight at the OK Corral, and a lot of these were bought and cut down and used by the Wells Fargo Company, which is kind of interesting. Another interesting tidbit is that George Wheeler Schofield, after his wife died, uh, a couple of years later, he actually dressed up in his army dress uniforms and uh, grabbed a Schofield pistol and shot himself and killed himself uh, with his own creation. Okay, so here we have the Uberti 
Schofield. This is a 7 inch charcoal blue color case hardened. Uh, you can get them nickel plated, fully blued. Uh, this is the one that I like the most because of the color case hardening. I'm a big fan of that. Um, you can get some of the Colts single action armies in color case hardening as well. Uh, this blue, I really, really like this blue color. And I don't know if the camera picks it up, but it looks almost like a powder coating in a way. But that will turn gray over time if I take care of it. It's a fairly... Uh, finicky finish I guess it's a delicate finish you've really got to take care of it and keep it oiled uh, but it will eventually turn gray here we have 45 long colt that is what this one is chambered in so this is the cartridge that the original single action armies used that the United States government wanted to use these were not originally chambered in them uh, they were in things like 44 40 uh, 44 Russian 44 Smith and Wesson American and 45 Schofield uh, this is a 45 ACP. This is the bullet that everybody thinks is a death laser that kills everything if it hits it. Uh, now, keep in mind that at the time, they didn't have smokeless powder, so the powders were not quite as powerful. It took a lot more powder to push something to the speeds that you needed uh, to effectively kill things. Uh, so that's part of why the cartridges are bigger. Now we can load these with smokeless powder, and they have a bit more kick to them uh, so we don't necessarily need the cartridges that long but it's kind of fun and more accurate for the period so let's open this up we've got it on half cock now and uh, we're gonna open this up the top brake mechanism is up here you push that back and you can see the uh, the ejector kicks out there's a cam down here that as you rotate it it pushes that out and when you go all the way it snaps back in so that you can load it and then you can close it back that's how this is reloaded uh, we've basically got full cock half cock and after fired so whenever you fire it it goes down all the way that spur goes inside through the back and sets off the primer and then that's what fires the gun now this is a little bit finicky i don't know if there's something wrong with the gun or if it's just the way it was made but sometimes this bar here this is a, a locking bar i haven't looked up the real name for it but it interfaces with these in the cylinder and it locks the cylinder in place so this free spins out here there's nothing to lock it in place but um sometimes this bar there's there's like a position where the hammer catches and can be pushed forward and that bar won't that bar won't stay up so that bar can be depressed right now uh, sometimes when it's on when it appears to be on half cock you can depress that like that basically is what happens and then this won't lock in place and it doesn't want to line up so I don't know if that's something that actually happened on the real pistols or not but if you do it right it will lock in place and then everything lines up and it's clocked correctly and you can pull the hammer back and it will advance the cylinder when you pull the trigger it will fire cock it it advances the cylinder again uh, this is single action only so you have to pull the hammer to advance the cylinder and fire it um, there's no double action here so let's look at something else um, there's a lot of springs and levers and uh, all the way down into the handle there's trigger springs and hammer springs and a lot of them are like linear leaf springs um, but there's just a lot going on inside this frame and you can see there's screws here that hold this piece on there's not a piece on the other side this is solid over here they could put the levers and the springs down inside there and then put this plate on overneath uh, over overneath I made up a new word uh, they can put everything underneath that and then put the plate over it and lock it down so let's look at the advancing mechanism here on the back of the cylinder there's this uh, kind of sprocket thing in the middle and then here when you pull the hammer you can see that lever comes out and pushes up so that's what's advancing the cylinder and that's what clocks it and then this bar locks it in place it's there's similar me mechanisms on a lot of single action 
revolver. So as you pull the hammer, that locking bar goes down and this lever comes up and then the bar comes back up to lock the cylinder in place. You really have to have these clocked correctly or they won't fire. Um, the firing pin will hit over on the side away from the center, which is in the center is the, uh, the primer. So to load this, it's pretty simple. Um, you just drop them in, right? And you drop, drop them in. If you were going to carry this, you would leave the top one uh, unloaded because especially with a spur hammer like that, it's extremely, extremely dangerous. If you, if you bumped this hammer, it could snap closed, uh, break things inside and fire the cartridge. So you'd want that top cylinder that's lined up with the, um, with the hammer, you would want that to be empty. I'm going to go ahead and snap that down. There we go. When you rotate it back, it, re it resets the cam. Uh, so yeah, we would, let me get this bar set up correctly. There we go. So we would basically load five rounds and then close it. Oh, it didn't, it didn't lock correctly. I'm having trouble with that bar. Like I said, let's try it again. I don't want to cock it all the way while I'm inside. There we go. There it's locked. So you would carry it like this. The cylinder is locked. The hammer's at half cock. The top cylinder is empty. Of course, I left the other two cylinders empty as well. But whenever you would be ready to fire it, you would pull this hammer and it would start to rotate the cylinder. And I'm not going to rotate it all the way right now because I'm in a little bit of an awkward position and I don't want to accidentally shoot my house. There's nobody that direction, but you know, you got to be careful. So then to empty it, you would basically turn it upside down and flop those out and then flop the uh, cases out and then you could reload it. Um, and that's, that's how that operation would happen. And then you would close it back and you'd be ready to go. Now there, this does kick out all of the cases empty if they're fired or unfired. There's another pistol that was made around the time, that same time that was actually probably a better pistol all around. And that was the Merwin and Holbert. And, uh, you would on that one, you would pull the barrel and it would twist and the cylinder would twist and it would kick out just the fired rounds, which is actually really cool. We're going to go ahead and open that and set it back down there. That's basically all there is to loading it and unloading it. I hope I covered everything. Uh, we're not going into super technical details about what's going on inside there, but we covered it a little bit. All right, so here is the Schofield in Red Dead Redemption online. And this is about as close as I could get it to looking like the one that I own. It's not quite the same, but that's okay. Um, it is similar barrel length. And as you can see, it's slightly different, but in general, it looks like it functions uh, about the same. Now, my character here's got his booger hook on the trigger, and that's a problem, but that's okay, I guess, since it's a game. So, let's try to just shoot this thing. So, he cocks it, fires it. And in this game, you have to click to cock it again. Now, consequently, uh, that fireball coming out the end looks very similar to the way mine does, but it also shoots fire out the cylinder. Um, let's see, let's look at it this way again. Out the cylinder where it meets up with the barrel. So that gets kind of powder coated as well. So, so he doesn't really dump the shells out. The animation does show him loading it the way I showed in real life. It doesn't really dump the shells out so much. Let's see if we can get out here and yeah, and this is my other one. I decided, uh, I kind of want one that's nickel plated as well, <laughs> but I don't know. That's for another time. 
Let's see. Yeah, you can't really see what he does with it. It's, um, because I have to point the direction that I'm looking, I guess. But it doesn't look like he tips the gun over. But the shells would come out pretty quickly. Um, it, as long as he broke it over and held it upside down when he dumped it. So, uh, one more time. Let's pull this one up. Change our view. They just kind of pop out, I guess. That's what it looked like. So, pretty quick. And that is the Schofield in Red Dead. So, as always, thanks for watching.